Hey there, thanks for tuning into Duck Pricks. I'm Chris, and it may be 2024, but it sure feels like 2014 because we are getting a brand new animal inspired building for Lego Ninjago. This is the Wolf Mask Shadow Dojo, which is technically kind of an unofficial Lego Chima set because it is literally set in the wildness, which is the realm where Chima is from. So the setting is basically the same world as Chima. It's a giant building with a wolf head on it. It's basically a Chima set, and I find that really cool how LEGO is revisiting their older ideas and tying in the lore together. And so, without further ado, let's jump into our review of the brand new LEGO Ninjago Wolf Mask Shadow Dojo. All right, so this is set number 71813, the Wolf Mask Shadow Dojo. It comes with 1,190 pieces, 8 minifigures, with 3 of them currently being unique to the set itself, and retails for 120 US dollars, 120 euros, or 105 British pounds. Out of all the minifigures, this is our largest assortment of ninja in their new climber outfits, coming with Kai, Zane, Lloyd, and Nia, with Zane, Lloyd, and Nia being exclusive to the set for now, and on the villain side, we have a pretty equal representation. You have Lord Roz, his two generals, Cinder and Jordana, as well as a generic wolf mask henchman to assist him in the cause. Altogether, this is one of the most recent examples of Ninjago really investing in these larger villain sets, which is really exciting because, for me, I love ninja vehicles, I love ninja locations, but I really love it when they do something unique for the villains of each wave. And sometimes we get something cool, and other times we don't really get too much. This is a really good example of getting a really large and dedicated villain base, which I am really, really excited to dive into. And the designers have specifically stated that if this set does well, they will produce more villain sets. If it doesn't do well, we're probably going to mostly just see more of the same ninja sets because they got to go with what sells the best. So if you do want to see more unique villain stuff from LEGO, I highly recommend that you at least give this set a shot because it's a really fun base, there's a lot of play features, maybe it's not the best villain layer we've gotten from Ninjago or from LEGO, but it is a lot of fun and I can't wait to dive into it right now. We're going to start off by setting aside the minifigures and just primarily taking a look at the main structure itself because that's really what you're paying for in these sets. Now the first thing that you build is this large battle arena area in the center. This is not actually attached to anything whatsoever. So this is kind of its own standalone thing. Personally, I think it would have been nice to attach this up to the base itself, but as it is right now, it's okay that it's a standalone arena type of thing. Now, this is actually really cool because the play feature here is that either you can do it yourself or you can actually do it with a friend, but you kind of actuate the mixel joints and the mini ball joints on the sides here and have your mini figures be battling. Like maybe you've got Cinder using Shatter Spin and he's just gonna absolutely obliterate Kai there. And there's just so many different fun things that you can do by posing around the mini figures. It almost feels like a modern example of those old dual sets that we used to get for Star Wars, like the Mustafar battle of Obi-Wan versus Anakin. But this is just so much fun and the hooks on the weapons really make it hard to see who is actually going to win the fight so it's actually a ton of fun to play around with figures in this way and I really do like this inclusion. It's fairly simple but I do like it, it plays well and you have that wolf motif with these spikes and the claws almost feeling like the open jaws of a wolf mouth which is of course really fun. The build is fairly simple, and yes, you can choose to leave these off if you want, so you can remove the mixel joints and just kind of see it as the base floor of the arena, but let's be real, this is really the thing to do with it. It's so much fun to actually have your minifigures be battling here, and I think it's a great addition to the set. Setting that aside though, the rest of the build is pretty much just one large thing and we're going to go piece by piece because there's actually quite a lot to see and do here. In contrast to the Dragonstone Shrine which I reviewed yesterday, which was more of a smaller and compact build chock full of detail, but one that wasn't necessarily a playset style of thing, this feels the most to me like a traditional LEGO playset. It is basically just a facade. It's very, very narrow, and there are a lot of pros and cons to the way they've done that, but I definitely feel like, you know, it's a very narrow thing, and I would have liked it to be a little more three-dimensional. Like, if you look at the thickness of the walls of the dojo itself, it's like four studs thick, so there's not a lot going on, but it makes up for that in terms of sheer size. This is 
physically very, very large, and there's at least a good amount of things that you can do once you turn it around. There's interior space that you can pose your minifigures up and play around with them. However, of course, the best way to view the set is from the front, and I just want to take a look to really just highlight some of the really nice details here. If you look on one side, you have these mystical looking rocks, which are really, really interesting. You have these kind of crackling energy bits written into them. They're runes in the rocks themselves, and I do like the parts usage. Like, this is like a helicopter blade here for that part of the rock. It's a really nice touch, and I feel like it adds a lot to the scenery of the wildness itself. Around the sides, you actually have a platform where you can have minifigures be climbing upwards, so you can imagine that if you're sneaking in to the dojo, you can kind of climb up around the side here, do a little of the parkour, you can kind of hook onwards and make your way to the very top, so that's just a fun little play feature to have integrated into the set itself. And then on the inside of the center, you just have a little bit of a bone, some claws, maybe some like menacing tree growth, and then you get to the other side, which is really nice because this is a full-on black tree, there's a target sign for target practice, and I do really appreciate the asymmetrical vibe of the way the set is laid out. One of which has these mystical rocks that are growing out of the ground, and the other one is a tree, and you can really see how that tree is curved, it kind of curves outwards and bends, so you have the tree trunks snaking out of the sides, and I do really appreciate the way that they've actually managed to design this, because they they actually make the tree feel a lot more organic just being built out of standard curves and shapings. In fact, a lot of the pieces of the set go into making this tree really robust and solid. You can pick it up by just this tree, it's almost like a handle for the entire set itself, which is very, very impressive. Although we'll be getting to maybe whether or not that was the best use of the parts budget, we'll see. But I do really like it for what it is. Now, moving onwards to the next pieces of the set itself, on the outskirts, you've got these little zip lines, and obviously these are specifically designed so the Climber Ninja can actually kind of use their specialized climbing hooks and rappel down, maybe making an escape from the dojo. So, the way it's supposed to work is, as you can see there, your ninja are supposed to rappel downwards like zhoop, and then jump down to the tree. It's a feature that works sometimes, especially because there is a lot of friction, and if it was a piece of string, it would be a lot smoother to have your minifigures really just glide all the way down. This is a rubberized piece, so even if they used flex hose, I feel like that would be easier, but now it's a little bit jerky, but you can use your imagination and just kind of manually move your minifigures like that to allow you to have that play function. And of course, in the center is the Gong of Shattering. This is a really important artifact in the newest season of Dragon's Rising, which at this time has not been released yet, so I really don't know that many details about it at the time of recording this video, but the trailer did just come out today for Season 2, so again, it was featured. We've seen Raz strike the gong with his hammer a ton of times in the trailers, causing his minions to maybe gain the power of Shatterspin and don the wolf masks, so thankfully, you can actually have Raz walk up to the gong and boom! strike it like so, and it's very satisfying to watch it kind of swing back and forth as Raz is like striking the gong itself. It has a very satisfying clink to it, which is really nice, and the center of it is just using the shield element, which we've seen for a lot. It was introduced in Captain America back in 2012 for the Avengers movies, but it works totally well as this kind of medieval style of gong and shield, and I'm really excited about where that plays into the story. Moving onwards to here, there is a small weapons rack, and to be completely honest, this is just alright. I mean, it's kind of weird how the spears just sort of sit there, like the spears are just loose, and I don't really know how I feel about that, because if you lift the set up, then these spears might just fall out, but it is what it is. It is just a little weapons rack to be added onto the set itself. There's a small little build for some of the enchanted trees over there of the wildness, and then over here you have a prison area where on the set artwork, Zane is imprisoned via the chains. That may just be something the set kind of came up with. I don't know if that's going to play a part in the show. It might just be something they created to add a little bit more play to the set, but the idea is that you take a minifigure and you can kind of imprison them. You basically have them standing up here, you remove their weapons, and you wrap the chain around them, and for the most part it should, there we go, should wrap all the way around the character, and there you have it. Now you have a character who is fully imprisoned right there. So, so this is kind of a nice little play feature. It's the, not the most exciting thing. It's very, very simple in the way it's set up, but it just allows for a little bit more interesting and dynamic play when it comes to the bottom part of the set itself. 
Of course, I keep calling this the Lost Chima set, and well, that's because of this bad boy right here. This is probably one of the most dynamic, large-scale animal heads that LEGO has really ever done, and yes, I'm counting Chima in that. It is really, really cool how they were able to use modern pieces, modern building techniques to really make this very menacing wolf head, and I just love the way this looks. Now, you do have this rock in the jaws of the wolf head itself, and the entire point of it is that you can kind of have the rock fall outwards and fall onto the enemies of the wolf mass shadow dojo so this is just kind of a, a little studs on the side type of ball here but as you can see with the rock removed you have the wolf head which is just kind of its own standalone thing and really the only unfortunate thing is that without the rock in the mouth there isn't really a way to keep the jaw open because they chose to mount it on a technic pin so if it's all the way up that's okay but if you want to keep it at like this position you can't really do that. It will just automatically close, no matter what you do. It would have been nice if it was mounted on a ratchet joint like the bottom jaw is, but I guess they wanted to have a little bit more flexibility in the way the wolf head moves, and I think in the show you can already see that it does have that rock in the mouth, so maybe that's just an aesthetic feature. It's not attached to anything, it just kind of sits there, but it is certainly an interesting feature to have, and we'll see if that plays a factor in the show itself. Overall, though, this is a really good build. I love the way that it's done, and it feels very menacing very 3D, it has really just great detail from pretty much every angle, even top down looks really good, so I do love that very iconic wolf head in the center of the model. Now on the inside there are a couple of different artifacts that you can see on the inside of the set itself. This is presumably the hammer that Roz uses to actually strike the Gong of Shattering. It's the same build we've seen in a couple different sets of the exact hammer, so I'm sure that that's going to play an important role in the show. And then over here we have another weapon that I'm not really sure if that's actually something important or if it's something they just came up with for the set itself. It's just some like kind of, it feels like a Chima weapon, you know? This feels like something that they would throw together. It would be in like the back of a Chima set. And I kind of like it because it feels very congruent given that this set is literally set in the same realm that Chima is. So this is kind of technically a Chima set. Now you may notice a Technic mechanism on one side here if you lift up this tree. It allows you to actuate the trap door. So there's a trap door in the center of the model. Let's say your brave ninja have made their way into the center of the dojo. They're ready to confront Raz, but oh wait, you lift it up and the trap door opens and they fall through. It is the most simple play feature ever. It is basically kind of the, the most like classic Lego play feature of this temple, but it's nice they did factor that in as something that you can actually do with the temple itself. And what is nice is that this actually has a ton of interior detail in terms of presumably lore specific things. On the one side here, you've got the Gong of Shattering or something that looks like it imbuing the Wolf Mask with energy. So I think that's what we've seen in the trailers where Cinder gets powered up with the Wolf Mask and then is able to perform Shatter Spin. And then over here, you actually have a just wolf leader, maybe with one of those swords, with the Blood Moon leading the wolves to victory. So we'll see if those play into the show, but it's just nice little kind of ancient looking artwork. They almost look like stained glass in the way they're presented here, which I think is really cool. And that's a quite nice setup to have for the inside of the Monastery and Dojo itself. Now the funny thing is that in here you can see Lord Raz and Wu might not be so different because both seem to sit down and just like to enjoy a nice cup of tea. So Raz is cooking up some tea here and then on the other side you have a blue flame as well as a katana which is just a nice little detail for a shrine. Now, I will say that the weaknesses of the set really start to shine through when you look at it from like this angle, because from this angle it is very, very skinny. There is not a lot going on with the set itself. There are some nice details, but it's the most basic type of interior you would expect, and honestly, this kind of reminds me of the interior we would have gotten in like 2011 with the Fire Temple. Not necessarily a 2024 set. Sure, the building techniques of the wolf head are really good, and I really actually do like the outside front of the facade of the temple itself, utilizing these windscreen elements. They're classic windscreens, but recolored in the dark pink color, really make it feel like this congruent and continuous kind of line snaking through the entire thing. I think this is a really cool detail to be included into the top of the temple itself. But if you look at it, the roofs are very much just two-dimensional, they're very flat, there's not a lot of depth to the set itself, and you really have to stretch your imagination, because from the front on, you can imagine that this is like a pretty large and formidable fortress, right? Like you can think, oh, this stretches all the way back, maybe it's built into the side of a mountain, 
But then you kind of have to suspend your disbelief here when you look at the actual set, and it's just so, so skinny. There's not a ton to actually do in the set itself. Really, that's my only major complaint about it, and for $120, I don't really even know what they could have done differently, because you're pretty maxed out, it's a good 10 cent price per part ratio, in fact, it's even better in some regions, I think it's exactly 11 cents, but all in all, I feel like they did the best they could given the budget of the set, but it just feels like maybe they could have potentially scaled it back a little bit and made it a little bit more three-dimensional, but... I also do understand that that is really not what they were trying to go for for this set. All I can hope is that this set sells well and will continue to get more villain sets from Ninjago because they are consistently the most interesting sets they come out with, and I miss the days when the waves were honestly kind of focused on the villains and the ninja might get a few small vehicles here and there. Now it feels like kind of the opposite. The last detail I do want to point out is this phenomenal new print for the mysterious Blood Moon on the top of the temple itself. Now this is really, really cool because it has a brand new print for the moon itself. It has a brand new kind of circular print. The moon is surprisingly incredibly detailed. Like you can see there's just so much detail packed into the piece itself. It does kind of look like an eye, especially because you do have a two by two circular piece here to kind of disguise the fact that there are actually studs and a hole on this thing. So. That's a little unavoidable, I get what they were trying to do with it, sort of looking like an eclipse and hoping that this piece blended into the back black background, but overall, it's a really, really cool piece to include, and I'm very excited to see how that plays into the entire story of Season 2. Altogether, for $120, the value is there for this set. It definitely does feel like a set that you're really getting your money's worth when you get it. The question is, is this going to perform well enough to actually convince the Ninjago and more likely the business team at LEGO to give us more villain-based sets, which is something I've been asking for for a long, long time. Like, if you look at the previous wave, Imperium barely got anything. They had a few flying side builds, one $20 wolf, and really that was about it, and I guess a side build of a mech. So in comparison, this is already a lot more... But I do wish that they were able to just give us more villain stuff, because the villains are the most interesting parts of many waves, and some of the best Ninjago waves, like Skybound, were primarily villain-focused. And with that, I think it's time to zoom in on the minifigures themselves. I plan to do a separate video taking a look at the minifigures of all of the Dragon's Rising sets individually, so do stay tuned for that video, which should be coming out in the near future, but for now we'll just take a look at the ninja to start. I'm gonna go over the climber suits, and we'll start off with Kai because he's the one that appears across most of the sets. He comes in three of the different sets. Now, I am so mixed on the climber armor because on the one hand, I think these armor pieces that are dual molded are probably some of the best armor pieces we have ever gotten for the ninja. They give me the vibes of the season 11 ice samurai, which were also dual molded and looked beautiful, and even that, LEGO has made them in six different colors for each of the six original ninja themselves. That is dedication, and that is really, really cool. I cannot wait for these to appear on Pick a Brick. I'm gonna get so many of them. I'll use them for my own minifigures and samurai stuff. The armor pieces are so cool. Here's my issue. I've talked about this at length, but you can't move the heads. One thing I love to do is take my minifigures to interesting locations and pose them. I'm literally going to Japan tomorrow, and I'm gonna bring all these minifigures to pose them, but to pose your minifigures, you kind of need to be able to move their heads. But unfortunately, you literally cannot, because the mask is once again built into the armor. Now imagine if they had given us this armor piece, but just without the mask covering the head, just, just remove this part of it, imagine how good that would have looked, because then you could actually take your minifigure heads you could actually move them around, you could have them be looking like on the side like this, you could put the hair on, you can put a different hood on. I don't know why they didn't do that, and that is one of the biggest misses in terms of really all the Dragon's Rising suits for me in particular, is that I love it when you can move the minifigure heads. The Ninjago movie was amazing because you could actually move their heads fully in their hoods, but this is a bit of a step backwards, back to like 2011 and even some of the 2019 hoods where you just can't move the heads and that's a little bit disappointing for me. Color scheme wise, the minifigures are mixed. I think Kai's works out pretty well because the dark red, golden red looks really good. I don't know how I feel about Zane's. I almost feel like the armor should have been silver instead of light gray. I feel like silver arms and silver uh, secondary color scheme would have looked good. 
Maybe it's just the white headpiece that's throwing me off. I don't know. The color scheme, not 100% sold for Zane. Or maybe I wish the armor was white. Like, if this was white instead, and maybe if they recolored this in gray, there's something they could have done to make it more interesting. But I get what they were going for. They were trying to go for a darker color for this kind of central armor piece. So I understand it, but I still think it would have been cool to get maybe something a little different for Jay. Lloyd, on the other hand, is so good. I only wish that this piece was dark green, but otherwise, he just looks really, really great in this particular armor combo. You've got dark green, regular bright green, as well as the gold mixed into him, and that's just so, so cool. It's such a clean color scheme. I just love the look and feel of this character, and again, the armor is great. I mean, I just only wish you could turn the heads. And lastly, Nia has a bit of a mix between the azure, gunmetal gray, and gold, and... I guess that works, but one thing I also really associate with Nia is the maroon color. Maybe making the belt and this part maroon would have been just one color too many, but I think it would have been cool to actually have a little bit of more visual kind of tertiary colors in the suit itself. So it is what it is. I think it's alright, and again, I feel like this top hood piece just isn't quite matching up for me with the bottom piece, but it is what it is. They only had limited budget and they already gave us dual molded armor pieces in six different colors for this set wave, with this set coming with three unique ones, so who am I really to complain? Lord Ross is a repeat from the January wave, so I don't have that much to say about him extra. I also just covered him in yesterday's Dragonstone Shrine review. I like the color scheme, but wish he had printed arms. Same with Jordana and Cinder, the only new thing is that Cinder is sporting a brand new dual molded sword. This is one of the coolest new Ninjago kind of villain weapon specific molds. It's dual molded in gunmetal gray and transparent red and it looks so cool. You even have almost what looks to be like a blood symbol in the center of it which is very menacing. Love the design of this minifigure, and overall you have a transparent black head, the backside you have the mouth covered, this is what it looks like on the front side, and I really do like the Cinder minifigure. Jordana is a little less interesting, but it's still cool to get her in minifigure form. They have identical outfits, and really just kind of have these specialized headpieces, which makes sense given they're the two generals. And lastly, this is just another identical wolf warrior that we've talked about a lot. I really do like these henchmen, I can't wait to army build them, and they're pretty cool. All in all, that about sums up our review of the $120 Wolf Mask Shadow Dojo. Definitely one of those sets that I have mixed feelings on. It is very much a facade, and I usually like it. I think I personally gravitate towards sets that are more 3D and fleshed in. I think I prefer the Dragonstone Shrine a lot to the set. But that's not to say that this set is bad, it just really isn't quite my cup of tea when I'm getting a large-scale LEGO set. I really love it when they're fully enclosed, but I understand that for kids, this is really what you want to have. Like, kids are going to love, well hopefully kids are going to love this set, love the play features, there are so many places to pose minifigures, to get crazy with the action, and it is a lot of fun to play around with it. But will this be good enough to convince LEGO to make more villain sets? Well, now the answer's up to you. Don't buy it if you don't want it. Like, I'm not saying to buy it just to support villain sets, but I don't know if LEGO should have put all their villain eggs in one basket. Like, just because this doesn't sell amazingly doesn't mean they should give up on giving us big villain sets in the future. I don't know. We'll have to see. What I will say is that day one opening at my LEGO store, the first set to sell out was Kai's Climber Mech and then the Dragonstone Shrine, and then I was there for like an hour and this was one of the only Ninjago sets to not sell out. Everything else did, so I don't know. Maybe maybe LEGO is right. I mean, LEGO is definitely right. Ninja focus sets just sell better than villain sets, but the villain sets are just so much more interesting and I hope that we get more because this is a lot of fun. All right, and with that, we have summed up our look at this brand new LEGO Ninjago set. Let me know down in the comments, what do you think of the set? Do you like it? Do you dislike it? Personally, I'm a little mixed on it because I feel like the design is really fun. There are lots of really cool play features, but it does feel very flat like a facade. Ninjago has done a lot of great things in the past with giving us fully fleshed out buildings. And this time they kind of took the price point of $120 and went for just large and imposing size, but not a lot of depth. So I'm really curious to hear what your thoughts are on kind of the dichotomy between these two things. Would you prefer something smaller but fully shaped, kind of like the Dragonstone Shrine, which is at the same price as this? Or do you like it when LEGO does make these big and sprawling play sets that look cool but don't have a lot of depth? That's all for now. Thank you so much for tuning into Duck Bricks. Be sure to like and subscribe for even more LEGO news, reviews, discussion, and analyses coming away very soon, and bye for now.